Hey, I'm Smitty Chad, and I've been trying to beat the Kerbal Space Program to four science update using only aircraft. At the end of the last episode, I shared a little teaser that I was trying to drop a rover at Cappy Rock, a rock named after the Kerbal version of Cappy Paras. And well, it turns out we didn't actually need the rover because we have a lander can right there. So we replaced the rover with two giant drop tanks and a bunch of extra fuel, and it's time to take off on our journey. I'm going to use this map that I made for the Lathe Force series to show you the actual flight plan today, and it's going to be a fairly long journey for KSP, totaling in 1,400 kilometers or 870 miles one way. So it's probably needless to say that we're very heavy on fuel. So to counteract this, I added some tiny little Jado rockets on the bottom there, uh, which kind of actually worked. They weren't entirely needed, though. All of the extra fuel did raise our takeoff speed from 60 meters per second to over 100 meters per second, though. After I take off, I immediately start heading south, and we're going to be flying south for a very long time in the dark. I'm going to use these little uh, canards on the front to fine-tune our trim on the aircraft. I'm using the regular trim that's built into KSP and these over top of it. Lots of roll issues. And after an hour or so, we're finally in the daylight. And with the daylight comes a revelation that actually left a nose cone off the tail segment there. I'm sure that really helped in our drag losses for the trip. And now we're turning into the last leg of our flight, which should theoretically be a straight shot to Cappy Rock from here. And if you're wondering why I did the flight like this, it was just a lot easier to hold a direct south heading and then direct east heading while sitting there for hours on end babying this craft because it had a lot of roll issues. And speaking of those, this tank was draining, but this one was not. No idea why I was doing that, but we needed to do something drastic to fix it. So I decided to uh, go on a little bit of emergency landing right here on this island, which was the nearest piece of land to us. And uh, just so happens that there's a nice beach to land it on. The only problem here was I had to come down extremely fast for the landing area that I'd picked out. And I didn't know just how nose heavy and just how ineffective our elevator was. And when I tell you that my soul left my body when that plane got that close to the ground, I mean it because our last save was way, way back and I would have had to redo so much flying if that would have hit the ground. But luckily, it didn't make it and we did have a very bouncy landing farther down the beach. <laughs> that, was a, that was probably the sketchiest landing on this series yet. <laughs> So anyway, we switch around all of our fuel here on the ground. I didn't really, I think, need to land for this, but I also wanted to save the game here since I was afraid if I quick saved the game mid-air and left for any amount of time that I would come back and it would just fall apart every time I quick loaded. So we turn around back on our heading to Cappy Rock, which is really not that far away now. It's just right over there in that little desert. And uh, after all that flying earlier, this really felt like nothing. But our drop tanks quickly uh, ran out of the last little bit of fuel that they had, and it was time to drop them. At least you would think that's the idea. They had other plans, however, and decided to fly away better than the plane was flying. I, I, I don't know what's going on here, and I, I, I don't think I want to know. Uh, but anyway, we finally make it within sight of the desert, and we get our little waypoint for the mission. Uh, our cappy waypoint. Call it the Cappy Point. So we followed the Cappy Point down to Cappy Rock, and we plan to Cappy Land at it. Uh, you could make a really bad drinking game out of all the times I say Cappy in this video. Anyway, the land here is very bumpy, and it's on the side of a freaking mountain, so it's not really the best place to land a really big cargo plane like this. So uh, we tried to maybe land it on top of the little flat head of the rock Capybara, but uh, that didn't really work out too well either. I wasn't really expecting to actually land it here, maybe just touch it and get the mission requirement that way, but it looks like we're just going to have to properly land the plane and touch Cappy Rock. And there's only really one way I can do it in this terrain. We're going to land it on a beach, which is what we do best in this series. We're going to go down here and land it on this little freshwater lakes beach, and then we're going to do probably the most Kerbal thing I could possibly do in this circumstance. Uh, you'll see here in a second. Also, I have absolutely no excuse for why this is such a bad landing. <laughs> it was it was really pretty good terrain. I, I shouldn't have botched it like that, but it worked, so I stuck with it. And now we do that very Kerbal thing I was talking about. A jet-assisted rock crawl up to Cappy Rock. <laughs> this worked out a lot better than you might think it would work out. And, uh, well, we did lose two navigation lights, but who needs those anyway? It's not like anyone else is flying around. But after a while, we do touch Cappy Rock and get that mission. Now, I could just leave it off right here and collect the plane, or recover the plane, rather, and collect all that science that we uh, worked so hard for, but I decided to get the man, the myth, the legend, Jebediah Kerman out and walk him up to the top of the rock. Now, he does have very tiny legs, but luckily, Jebediah has the heart and soul of a Skyrim horse, so he can climb about any mountain if you give him enough time. Um, so I did give him enough time, and he made it right up to the top, 
and it turns out that Jebediah Kerman has absolutely infinite energy, and flying for so long, then hacking a giant rock does absolutely nothing to the man. So he grabs a little sample, and it wasn't worth that much science, but we are completely done here now, and we go cash in that mission for 400 science. And after we cash that in, we get a brand new mission to go to Stargazer Point, which I think is a little bit closer, but we're going to focus on getting that Duna Monument mission for right now. So that requires us getting a few more things. Well, it doesn't really require us to. I just really wanted to get those payload bays. And now we're going to work on our little Duna probe. So I was just going to do a drop probe that can kind of maneuver itself around and land at the monument. It's nothing fancy. We're going to do a rover, but right now we just don't have the tech to send a full rover there, uh, safely at least. And we're going to upgrade that little uh, SSTO that was completely accidentally an SSTO from uh, one of the very first episodes, I think the second episode. We're going to upgrade it for the Duna mission and color it as such. I always love upgrading planes that we have already instead of making new ones. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, I say. So I was expecting a fairly familiar launch from this. Unfortunately, though, it had some serious and very strange roll issues going on. I have no idea what's going on with all the roll problems in KSP2, but we do get this to orbit and disconnect our little payload there. And I immediately started getting the little payload ready to go to Duna. Got the antenna out and lined everything up. I did, however, forget about this small thing called transfer windows. So we got out the interplanetary protractor and got a good enough transfer window and began making our maneuver node. And after a solid 10 minutes of battling with the maneuver node planner in KSP2, uh, we made our little burn to Duna. Well, roughly in the direction of Duna. <laughs> and we're going to use the wonderful, awesome power of mid-course corrections to actually get an intercept. As I always say, if you can't get an encounter in LKO, just do a big fat mid-course correction and you'll eventually get some kind of encounter with the planet. So we did get an encounter with the planet, and I was doing it over top of the North Pole here to get a polar orbit so we can just pick the landing spot because I didn't really check where the uh, monument was beforehand. And I'm just admiring how beautiful Mars, I mean, Duna is in KSP2. It's truly, really, really pretty. And after much time warping, I bring our little impact point down very close, a little bit to the right and below the uh, place we're trying to land at to account for the rotation of planet and the drag. And we're also running some atmospheric science sniffing in the background. Uh, which didn't really work out for us because she had to stay two minutes in a certain place to do that. And it's at this point that we start kind of losing control of our entire craft. And we start really missing the monument. Um, we don't have any way of rolling there or doing anything else. So I need to launch this back up and get another trajectory that will land us kind of at the monument. I don't remember the Duna atmosphere being thick enough to do that kind of stuff, but it was really pulling us off course. So finally, we do get it kind of lined up with the monument, which is on this little uh, mountain peak in the middle of a crater there. I forgot what you call that. It's kind of like the water effect when the drop comes back up. But anyway, that's completely beside the uh, point. <laughs> we land it over here as close as we can get, and we finally run out of fuel in that <laughs> one single stage that's been taking us all the way here. And we drop our little probe with a big, massive parachute which doesn't completely slow it down to a safe velocity. It's a pretty safe, six meters per second. You can survive that. But we have that little engine on there for last minute maneuvering. And that was the intended plan, as janky as this looks. Um, and we finally get our Duna mission right here. There we go. And this is gonna be a whole heap of science, believe me. And it tips over. <laughs> Turns out that I did the whole antenna landing legs thing a little bit wrong, but it's still there on the surface of Duna next to the monument. And uh, we're completely done here. So we're going to head over to Mission Control and cash in that massive science reward of 2,000 science points for a single mission. And you already know what time it is. We're over in the RD Center unlocking Tier 3 finally. We're also going to pick up a bunch of extra nodes in Tier 2 to try to complete it out like we did Tier 1. And now we have a direct shot to the Whiplash Engine, which is going to make SSTOs so much easier. That's going to require a lot of science though. Science that we're going to get from our most dangerous mission yet. The next episode's gonna be very purple and very intense. But that's all I've got for today. On the left are some images sent to my viewers just like you, and on the right is either the next or the last episode, depending on when you're watching this. Thank you so much for checking out the series and supporting this so much. I'll be back next week.